Side eight. Well, said Mr. M when Mrs. Cleave had finally left, we've got our marching orders then. I gather you're spending your summer holidays with me because I'm your uncle, and I'm helping you to get over being an orphan. And you might be coming to live with me permanently. His eyes roved over Harry's face. What did you say to her? You've got her eating out of your hand. Who taught you how to handle women? I lived with me mom for twelve years. She's just like me mom. Mister M threw back his head and laughed. It was the first time Harry had ever heard him laugh. It wasn't to be the last. The best day was the day they climbed Hedgehog. They went on the bus, a little battered, muddy country bus that groaned and rattled and squeaked its way round the tight bends, with a conductor who seemed to know everybody's name and asked about all their friends and relations. A conductor who received parcels from people who weren't even travelling on the bus, and gave out the parcels to others who were eagerly waiting at bus stops. Silly little parcels, like half a dozen eggs in a bag or a bundle of rhubarb, and he didn't charge them anything, just doing it out of the goodness of his heart. Mister M said, and one old man got on with a live hen tucked under his arm, a hen that watched Harry with its sharp yellow eye and pecked at the old man's serge sleeve with a sharp yellow bill. Another old man had a well-grown lamb that bleated all the way and left droppings in the aisle, and everybody called to each other down the aisle like one big happy family. After that, Hedgehop seemed very silent, with just some invisible birds calling from out of the sun-warmed heather that Mister M said were curlews. As they climbed higher and higher, the county of Northumberland spread out wider and wider around them, deep rounded valleys and straggles of tiny grey houses. Mr. M said Hedgehog was the second highest mountain in Northumberland, and that the highest over there was Cheviot itself. Why didn't we climb that? Asked Harry. No view from the top, said Mr. M. Just a great flat top, muddy old pudding. Hedgehog gave views all the way up. When they reached the cairn at the top, Mr. M pointed out Lindus Farm lying like a crumpled lady's handkerchief on the sea, and the farms and Pensham Monument in County Durham, and the mountains of the Lake District, a misty tinge far to the west. It's like you can see the whole world," said Harry. "Oh, there are far better views from the top of Scarfell. You can see the Isle of Man and the Irish coast, and from Mont Blanc. Have you climbed Mont Blanc? Oh, many years ago, as a young man, I'd like to do it again before I'm too old. If this war doesn't drag on forever, oh, I'd like to climb Mont Blanc. Is it very difficult? Cold? Does the snow on top lie all year round? You could manage it if we got you in training for it." If we got you in training for it, that meant it might really happen some day. The world seemed to open out at Harry's feet, not just the view from Hedgehog, but the view from every mountain in the world. Life seemed suddenly to go on forever and ever, and it was marvelous. Life with Mister M suddenly joined up with life as it had been before the last bomb. The things in between, the burning bricks of home, Mam, Dad, and Dulcie suddenly seemed incredibly small. Life would go on now. He knew it. As more than being hungry and soaking wet, as more than fighting angry farmers and the sea, life relaxed, full of good things as it used to be, when you could take it as it came. Except that, Mam and Dad and Dulcie wouldn't be there to see it. They must be in some hole in the ground by now, if they'd found anything of them at all. They were so far away now, so small. He suddenly found himself just standing. Crying there, Mister M didn't make a fuss or tell him to cheer up and stop it. Mister M just gently turned away to let him cry in private. Except Mister M's shoulders were gently shaking. Was Mister M crying too? That made it easier somehow. Nothing to be ashamed of. When it was all over, Mister M led the way without a word down the southern slopes of Hedgehog. There was more grass between the clumps of heather and bracken, and the air was stiller and warmer out of the wind. It got quite hot descending, and there were lots of big fat flies trying to drink your sweat. So Harry was glad when they came to the craggy hollow where the little stream they'd been following became a waterfall into a pool the colour of dark slate amid slopes of velvet green grass. God, I could just do with a swim," said Harry. "Thought you might." Mister M reached into his big rucksack with a smile and produced an old towel. And dark blue bathing trunks. There's a place to change behind those rocks. Harry took the towel and trunks and went behind the rocks. Somehow he knew the towel and trunks had been here before. Someone else had changed here. Someone else had bathed. 
When Mr. M watched him jumping in and splashing, he would be really seeing someone else. He knew what Mr. M wanted him for. To fill up a boy-sized hole inside himself. That was okay. That Harry felt able to do. It was no more than he'd done for Artie. The only difference was that he'd always known Artie would go away someday, and he had the sudden, breathtaking idea that Mr. M wasn't going away. Anywhere. Ever. He jumped and splashed a lot. Even after he'd had enough. Mr. M must get his money's worth, too. When he finally did come out, shivering and goose-fleshed, because the mountain water was pretty cold, Mr. M was busy pumping up an old brass primer stove, on which a billy can of water was boiling. Tea, said Mr. M. Nothing like a mug of hot tea after a swim, and cake, plenty of cake. Afterwards, they sat side by side, watching the fall of the water. A little breeze had got up that blew the thin stream to one side, so it wavered like smoke, never the same. Do you know what shepherds do with orphaned lambs in these hills? asked Mr. M. No, said Harry, abruptly. He hoped it wasn't something horrible that would spoil the wonderful day. They find a ewe whose lamb has died, and they take the skin off the dead lamb and tie it around the living lamb and put it to the ewe. And the ewe smells the smell of her dead lamb and takes to the living lamb inside the skin. It works. It really does. Oh, I'm glad, said Harry. It's nature. It sounds brutal, but it works. You get one happy ewe and one happy lamb. Yeah, said Harry. There seemed no need to say more. Chapter 18 I wouldn't have liked to live with St Cuthbert, said Mr Murgatroyd. He only changed his boots once a year. The other monks had to drag the old ones off him, and he used to wander about all night praying so the other monks couldn't get any sleep. They must have been quite glad when he went off to the inner farm. That's not what they taught us at school, said Harry, leaning his elbows on the wall next to Mr M's, just touching in a companionable sort of way. They only taught us he was holy and converted the heathen. Schools said Mr. M. I sometimes think all schoolmasters should be stood up against a wall and shot. They never teach boys anything interesting, or anything they really want to know. Too right, said Harry. That was what the Australian airmen said, who were billeted in Whitley Bay. It sounded slick and tough and grown up. He watched Don foraging through the long grass below the outer wall of Lindisfarne Priory. Don's fine now. Paul healed up wonderfully. He's a fine vet, is Mr. Harper. Harry put his mind out of gear, and watched the sunset, as the virtues of Mr. Harper were extolled once again. Mr. M couldn't half go on. Must be being a schoolmaster. But there were far worse things than going on. At least the awful silences were gone. Silences were comfy now, though rare, and Mr. M could look him in the face at last, even when he talked about his son, or Harry talked about his mam and dad. Mr. M said that crying was good for you, even for men. But he'd never cried again, and neither had Harry. But they'd watched the birds and walked along beaches, gone sea fishing once all night, and come home with a good catch of flatfish and fried some for breakfast. And Mrs. Cleave was as pleased as punch with both of them. She said Harry was filling out, and Mr. M looked ten years younger. Mr. M said she was like a hen with two chicks. One week of the holidays left, said Mr. M suddenly. Yeah, said Harry smugly. We can go sea fishing again. No, I don't mean that. I mean, I'll have to get back to work, and you'll have to get back to school. What school were you at? The high school, said Harry automatically, but the blue sky seemed to darken, the glitter go off the water between them and the mainland. I, I can't go back there. No, no, said Mr. M reassuringly, but if you went to the high school there, you can go to the high school here, the Duke's school at Annick, where I teach. Wouldn't mind that, I suppose. Oh, very gracious of you. We'll have to get you a uniform, but you'll be entitled to extra clothing coupons with being bombed out. I got some coupons in me attaché kiss, said Harry quickly. Mam was careful, she had a lot left. Yes, but, said Mr M, we can't go on living from hand to mouth, you know. We can't go on pretending you're my nephew forever. People have to be informed. Everything's got to be regular and above board. He suddenly sounded very schoolmasterish. We must do things properly. We can't go on like this. I don't want to go back, said Harry. Going back will ruin everything. Who cares? Your cousin Elsie. Harry shuddered. She won't want me. She's got six kids of her own. They live in two rooms in Back Brannan Street. It's a slum. Me mum and dad couldn't stand her. But she'll still make trouble. 
But it wasn't just Cousin Elsie, it was everything. He turned his back on North Shields forever. You didn't climb all the way up a mountain just to chuck yourself off the top and fall all the way back down again. That's enough, Harry. Mr. M spoke quite sharply. We're going back to North Shields tomorrow and we're going to set things straight. Then we'll come back here and make a fresh start. It won't take more than a few hours, for goodness sake. God, thought Harry bitterly. Grown-ups. You tell lies for them, you find them flat on the floor and pick them up and make them happy again, and then they start getting bossy. He had a wild thought about getting his stuff together again and sneaking off with Don in the middle of the night. But life was no good without your own person, and he'd never find another person as kind as Mr. M. And he was tired, tired of the road. All right, he said, but you'll be sorry. He never spoke a truer word. Chapter 19 Come on, said Mr. M briskly. We can't hang about all day. I've got the car started. She's going a treat. Don's in the back already. He can't wait to get moving. Harry got up wearily and said goodbye to the kitchen with its big hanging oil lamp and twin rocking chairs each side of the fireplace where they used to sit of an evening. Then he said a long goodbye to Mrs. Murgatroyd who twined about his legs on the doorstep. Oh, come on, called Mr. M. We'll be back in a few hours. Don barked one enthusiastic bark from the back seat of the car. Harry pitied the innocence of dogs. He got in and slammed the car door, like a prisoner slamming the door of his own cell. As they drove out, he said a silent goodbye to the goats and the chickens and the geese. Lovely morning for a drive, said Mr. M. Lucky I've got enough petrol. I get it for helping with the evacuees. I shouldn't be using it, really. But you're going to be an evacuee soon, I suppose. My evacuee. Really, we've hardly got time to get things sorted out before school starts. You'll need football kit and... He went on and on, making plans as they drove through the bright morning. Harry didn't listen. He was saying goodbye to his kingdom. The kingdom where Mr. M was king and he was prince. It was easy being a prince with Mr. M. You only had to be yourself and run and laugh and ask questions and help with everything like the goats and hens. And everything was a pleasure. He knew exactly what Mr. M wanted. They'd been lifting potatoes in the garden last night, Mr. M turning over the ground with the spade, and Harry feeling in the loose soil for the exciting small, round, smooth, cool shapes of the new potatoes. Then his hand had closed around something shriveled and large and soggy and yuck. He'd pulled it out with a squeak of horror, and seen it was another potato. That's the old man, said Mr. M. That's the potato I planted in the spring and the plant grew out of. The old man dies, but he gives us all these new potatoes and suddenly it was all clear in Harry's mind. The old man potato was the father, and the new potatoes were the sons. The life in the old man was passed on. Chuck him back, said Mr. M. His job's done. He's content. And suddenly Harry realised that Mr. M had been quite content to die in his own good time, when he'd passed on all the things he knew to all the sons he taught, and all the things he owned to his own son. But the new potato had died before the old man, in the blazing wreck of a battleship off the coast of Malaya and turned Mr. M's whole world upside down until Harry had turned up the new new potato. He wanted nothing in the whole world except to be Mr. M's new new potato. Except Mr. M was ruining everything. The kingdom was behind them now, destroyed, gone forever. And now the car running sweetly along was rolling up the map of Harry's journey too. Holy Island had vanished behind, where he'd fought the gang and fought the tide and won. They passed the old lady's house, then saw in the distance, near the cliff, the upward-pointed barrels of Artie's anti-aircraft guns, and the pillbox, where the RAF man had given him a watch, and even a thin trail of smoke emerging over the cliff edge that might have come from Joseph's chimney. And then the chip shop at New Biggin, and the old boat he and Don had hidden under, the endless day after the fight with the farmer. They were coming to the Blythe Ferry, and the place where Don had scared off the two men. It was all undone in less than an hour. All that sweat and pain and hope and despair, all the times he'd won and all the times he'd lost. He'd done it all for nothing. The whole journey, the whole kingdom by the sea, was only a few minutes' drive in a car. The old familiar scenes began to close in around him like prison warders. The haven and the chip shop at Tynemouth, 
And still Mr M prattled on about arranging school dinners and what class he might hope to be in at the Duke's school and how he'd teach Harry to carve shepherd's crooks in the long winter evenings. You'd better direct me from here, said Mr M. I'm quite lost now. Oh, Mr M, how right you are, but you don't know it. Left, said Harry. Left again. Right here. And then they were outside where his house had been. All there was left was the sagging garden gate and a few straggly bits of Dad's old privet hedge. Beyond, everything was flat, with weeds starting to grow among the bits of broken brick. It looked like nobody had ever lived there. Were bits of Mam and Dad and Dulcie still down there under the earth? Or had they dug enough out to be buried respectably in Preston Cemetery? He gave a great shudder. Even Mr M noticed. He put his arm around Harry's shoulder. Sorry, son, but you had to see it. You had to say goodbye properly. You couldn't go on running away forever. Now it's done. We can go. Go, said Harry. Go away? The warden's post, I think. They know what happened to people. They keep records. First right. Second left, said Harry, staring at the clutch and the brake pedals with Mr M's feet on them. He just felt sick. He just knew what was coming was utterly terrible. It hung over him like a thundercloud. The wardens were friendly and sympathetic. You could tell the raids had almost stopped for the summer because the wardens weren't tired to death or grey with seeing too many horrible things. There was almost a holiday atmosphere in the brick warden's post. Two of them were sitting outside on small wooden chairs getting a suntan. The dartboard looked well used. The head warden got down a great thick grimy book like the secretary's petty cash book at school. What date was it, roughly? he said gently. Harry told him. The warden licked the end of his great thick calloused finger and turned the dog-eared pages. Buggerly, he said. Buggerly, buggerly. Man, woman and child. And he said, hello, that's funny. The down here is being dead, but then the names have been crossed out again. Hey, Bill, do you know anything about this? Bill came and looked, but he didn't know anything either. The third man, Tommy, didn't know any more, except that the crossings out were official. Maybe they were dug out alive, after all. By the heavy rescue. The heavy rescue might know. They're in Prudder Street. Somehow, Harry got back into the car. He knew they hadn't been dug out alive from that heap of blazing rubble he'd left. It was all a balls-up, a cruel, crazy balls-up. He didn't even get out of the car when they got to Prudder Street. He left it to Mr M. Mr. M came back after a very long time. He got in and said in a low voice, They dug down through your house. They found nothing. Maybe they were all burnt up. The man assured me that they would have found something. They always find something. Harry had an awful vision of the chicken that Mam had forgotten about one over Merry New Year's Day and left far too long in the oven. He nearly threw up there and then. They suggest we try the hospital, said Mr M, very low and gentle. They said they'd know at the hospital. The mortuary's there too. Mr M was gone a long time at the hospital. Harry stared at the nurses passing in their starched uniforms. They just didn't seem to mean anything. He stroked Don's ears. That helped a bit. Then Mr M came back and his voice was all weird. They were here... He said, all three of them, William Baggerly, Mary Baggerly and Dulcie Margaret Baggerly in the children's ward. I've seen their records. Those were their names, weren't they? Yes, said Harry, those were their names. They were all quite badly hurt. Your dad had a broken leg and your mam crushed ribs and Dulcie had a lot of cuts from glass. They all had a lot of cuts from flying glass, but they've gone. Dulcie was the last. She was discharged a month ago. But said Harry. But he didn't believe a word of it. It was all just bits of writing on paper. He'd seen the house burning with its evil blue flames. Town Hall, said Mr M briskly. The Town Hall will know what happened to them. They told me how to get to the Town Hall. It was as well they had. Harry could never have told him. At the Town Hall, Mr M was much quicker. They've been rehoused. Number 11 Chestnut Road, the Ridges Estate. Do you know it? That proved it was all a lie. Mam and Dad would never go and live on the ridges. The ridges was where the slummy people lived. Mam and Dad would have died before they would go and live at the ridges. But Mr M was off again, 
driving like mad, full of excitement, the excitement of the chase. Harry stared dully out of the windscreen as the jungle-like front gardens and broken fences of the ridges closed in around him. People on the ridges smashed up the front garden fences for firewood. It was all a dream, a terrible mistaken nightmare. It must be three other people pretending to be his family on the ridges for some criminal reason. Half the people on the ridges had been in prison for nicking and all that. Number eleven, said Mr. M. Come on. He had to nearly drag Harry out of the car. They walked with Don up the cracked, ugly front path, past a garden full of weeds. His dad would never have had a garden full of weeds. Mr. M. knocked. There was the sound of footsteps coming. The front door opened slowly. Dad was standing there. He was leaning on a stick and he had terrible scars on his face and bare arms. He didn't look at all well and he had on a very baggy and awful pair of old trousers. But it was Dad. He looked at Mr. M inquiringly and then he looked down and saw Harry. You little bugger, he said angrily. Where have you been? You've had us worried out of our minds. Mam had burst into tears and hugged him then made a cup of tea and some very crude and ugly cups. Then they all sat round, except Dulcie, who stood by Mam's chair for a cuddle with a thumb in her mouth and listened with eyes like saucers. We was running down the garden to the shelter, said Dad, when the bomb hit. Must have blown us clear into the next door's garden, knocked us senseless. First thing I remember, I was waking up in hospital. But Jack Brightman, the warden, came to see us. They found us in Simpson's garden, number seven. So they just thought we were the Simpsons and got an ambulance and got us into hospital. What about the Simpsons? asked Harry. They were away on holiday. It was Smith's Dock Holiday Week. Now at last Harry remembered. Remembered the warden that terrible night saying that the Simpsons were safe in hospital. Remembered thinking there was something funny about the Simpsons being at home at all. But not being able to work it out. And what the hell have you been up to? asked Dad angrily. Where the hell have you been? The warden said you were dead, said Harry. So I, I just went away. Ran away, said Dad, his voice full of disgust. A big light like you running away. Running away, said Mam. I've cried myself to sleep every night, worrying what had happened to you. Running away, said Dulcie. And you weren't even scratched. You were in a shelter, cowardy, cowardy custard. She snuggled tighter into Mam's arm like she owned her. The scars on her face didn't make her look any prettier, and her dress was grubby. Suddenly, Harry really hated her. Her always running to Mam, telling tales. Her always sucking up to be Dad's little pet. Mam, said Dulcie, I'm frightened of that big dog. He's staring at me, he wants to bite me. She started to snuffle a bit, like she always had. That's my dog, yelled Harry. Don was just sitting peacefully with his tongue out because he was thirsty. Your dog, said Dad in an awful voice. What makes it your dog? I found him. He was the only friend I had. Well, you can just bloody well lose him again, shouted Dad. You're not bringing a great dog like that here. We can hardly feed ourselves, let alone a great humping dog like that. Harry looked at Don, at that faithful face that had gone through so much with him. And Don looked back at Harry as ever, his great brown eyes warm with adoration. You'll have to be put to sleep, said Dad with great finality. You'll never find you on a no, you bloody little fool. Fancy picking up a great hungry animal like that. He got no sense. It was too much. On the one side there was Don and the open air and the great winding sunlit coast of Northumberland. His whole kingdom that he'd found for himself, made for himself. And on the other side, these shabby, angry, bossy people in a disgusting ridges house, full of whining self-pity for what they had suffered. Narrow, narrow. He stood up, he said, If Don goes, I go. Go away, gasped Mam, turning very pale and clutching her neck. What does he mean, Dad, go? Dad glared at Harry, and Harry glared back at Dad. There was a long, long silence in which an awful lot was said. Harry and Dad would never be quite the same ever again. Oh, some things would get better, no doubt. Dad would get back to work when his leg was better. Dad was a good worker and made good money. And they wouldn't stay long on the ridges, but... Dad had never seen a gannet dive. He'd never seen the dawn come up over the breaking waves of Druridge Bay. He would never understand. None of them would ever understand, not even Mam. Harry had grown, and they hadn't. Harry had grown too big for his family, 
as if he'd drunk from some magic bottle like Alice in Wonderland. And Dad knew it and hated it. It was Mr. M who broke it up, gently. I'd be glad to look after the dog for you, he said. He'll be company for me. Right, that's settled then, said Dad. I'm beholden to you, and for bringing this young fool home. But he didn't sound beholden. He didn't sound grateful. He sounded pretty angry underneath. Mr. M knew. Mr. M got up to go. His shoulders dropped a bit, but his face was very kind. I'll see you to the car, said Harry, glaring at his family, daring them to try to stop him. They went out to the car, the car that was still waiting to take them back to the glorious kingdom. Don got cheerfully onto the back seat, but looked puzzled when Harry didn't get in. Mr. M got into the driver's seat and wound down the window and sat staring into space. I told you, said Harry, I told you we shouldn't have come back. Mr. M looked up at him amazed. I want to stay with you, said Harry. It was the truth. Mr. M's face lit up a little through the bleakness. I'll write and let you know how the dog gets on, he said. I'll write every week, said Harry. Twice a week. Steady on, said Mr. M. Once a month will do. Don't make your father jealous. He's a good man, really. He's been through a lot. So have you? I shall get over it, said Mr. M. Thanks to you. And Don here. We'll look after each other. I think we'll manage. And Harry thought he might, but he added, I'll come and see you both as often as I can. I'll hitchhike in the holidays like the soldiers do when they go on leave. You're welcome, if you can manage it. Go steady, though. Don't make trouble for yourself. I'm nearly 13. I'll soon be able to do what I like. None of us can ever do that, said Mr. M warningly. Not even when we're grown up. Then he said, Cheerio, with a tremble on his lips, and put the car into gear and drove away. As they turned out of the road, Harry caught a last glimpse of Don's face peering at him through the back window. And he went back inside. He paused in the hall, hearing Dulcie's voice. Who was that man? I didn't like him. I didn't like that dog. Funny sort of fella, said Ma'am. He talked very posh, not our sort, not our sort at all. I wonder if he's married, said Dad, or if he's one of that sort. Harry walked in. He was married, he said. But his wife died, and his son was killed on board the repulse off Malaya. That shut them up. But he stared at their faces, and wondered how he was going to keep his own mouth shut over all the years. The years before he got back to his kingdom by the sea. That was The Kingdom by the Sea by Robert Westall. Read by Kevin Waitley. We do hope you've enjoyed listening to this Chivers Children's audiobook. For details of other Chivers Children's titles, please contact us and we will be delighted to send you a catalogue listing all our titles, as well as information about our most recent releases. Our telephone number and address can be found on the box cover. <laughs>